Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this afternoon's COVID-19 Professional Education Webinar. My name is Matt McDonough, and on behalf of the End Stage Renal Disease National Coordinating Center and CMS, we want to take this opportunity to welcome you to this afternoon's event. Uh, before we do begin, uh, I want to remind you that this call is being recorded uh, and that the recording of this event will be published to our COVID-19 page, usually within 72 hours, although we do typically get them up, uh, published a little bit faster than that. Um, so look for that on our page in just a few days. Uh, so let's go right in and jump into our agenda. Uh, in a moment, we're going to talk about what this call is about, and we've made some changes to the format of this call that we do want to cover. Uh, I'll then have a chance to introduce today's speaker, which is Linda Ball from uh, HSAG Network 13. She's the Quality Improvement Director out at Network 13. She'll be talking to us today about challenges with dialysis access during COVID-19. Uh, and as always, uh, we do want to hear your questions that you may have for our speaker today. So at any point during today's event, if you have a question, you can submit that question using the chat panel or using the Q&A panel. Now, uh, you don't need to wait until the end of the event to ask your questions. Please feel free to submit them at any time. Uh, at the end of our event, we have allocated some time for Q&As, and as time allows, we will answer as many questions as we can before the conclusion our event, uh, at our event, which is scheduled to be 4 o'clock Eastern time today. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump to our what is this call all about discussion. Um, as with previous events, uh, this is an opportunity to hear from stakeholders and your peers that are in the ESRD community who are adapting to this ongoing COVID-19 dynamic. Uh, today's event is about those who are engaged with dialysis access tier status. Uh, as always, these calls are designed for uh, our speakers to be able to share examples with you and also provide some real-world strategies that you can put to use in your facilities or your organizations. Uh, and now, we, these have been recurring calls on a variety of topics, and I do want to take this opportunity to note that our format for these calls has changed a little bit. Uh, effective with today's call, our professional series will be offered every other week. Uh, the time has moved, as you can see from today, to 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, and we will be offering CEUs for attending these webinars. Uh, so the, the page where you would register is the same, and we'll talk about that at the end of our event, uh, but this is a format change that will be in effect moving forward. Uh, so let me take this moment now to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Linda Ball has been recognized as a national expert and international vascular ac access expert as well. She's published over 30 articles on vascular access. Uh, she's participated in the fistula first video, cannulation of the arteriovenous fistula. Uh, she's authored a cannulation chapter in a surgeon textbook, as well as the vascular access chapter in the new ANNA core curriculum. Her On Course with Cannulation workshop has been attended by more than 1,000 nurses and technicians across the country. Also, Linda is past president of the American Nephrology Nurses Association, ANNA. It is my great pleasure to turn things over to Linda. Okay, thanks, Matt. And thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is my disclaimer because I'm a contractor with CMS. We have to we have to say um, that everything that I'm presenting, I'm assuming full responsibility for. Next slide. Our objectives today, we're going to identify differences between dialysis access tier status of essential versus non-essential intervention. We're going to describe assessment of a vascular access aneurysm to identify tier status. And we're going to discuss nursing interventions for a patient with Steele syndrome. So first, we're going to talk about um, and define what essential versus non-essential surgery mean um, during COVID-19. So what does CMS exactly mean by this? Well, essential is something that is emergent. It really can't wait. Um, if somebody came in with a heart attack and needed a bypass surgery, that can't wait. We can't say, can you wait 30 days for that, please? No, you can't do that. So that is what they mean by essential. Non-essential is something that, um, while it needs to happen and, and they need some kind of an intervention, could it possibly be delayed? And initially what this meant was, can it be delayed for 30 days? Well, unfortunately, we've now been in this pandemic for five months, so they, they, they kind of didn't um, 
uh, we didn't know that it was going to last as long as it did. Um, and so on March 18th, that was the day that it was declared a pandemic, CMS recommended suspension of non-essential surgery. But, on, but CMS received a lot of feedback from providers, nephrologists, surgeons that experiencing difficulty scheduling for placement or repair of fistulas, grafts, central venous catheters, and peritoneal dialysis catheters. They, they weren't performing any of those things. Um, and you say, well, you know, how can a life-sustaining treatment not have an access for us to be able to do it, right? And so um, on March 26th, CMS clarified that dialysis was an essential surgery, saying that establishing vascular access is crucial for ESRD patients to receive their life-sustaining dialysis treatments. So um, the U.S. College of Surgeons developed a three-tier COVID-19 elective case triage guidelines for surgery. This was released on March 24th. We'll notice that our clarification came on March 26th. But they're still looking in, and they're still utilizing this tier status now. So the um, tier three definition is a do not postpone. Um, and so a clotted or non-functional dialysis access. We can't let that go. We have to fix that. So that was one that that's considered essential. An infected dialysis access. Um, we know that we have to take care of those right away as well, so we can't postpone that. How about a fistula that has an ulceration on it? Um, that's something that's very serious, and there's potential for excess rupture if we don't do something about that now. So, again, they do not postpone that. And, all right, you've just been diagnosed with kidney failure and you need dialysis. Well, that means you need a dialysis access, right? And so we can't postpone that either. Um, and they say that a tunnel dialysis catheter, we can't postpone that placement. Now let's look to the, the non-essential or the tier two, um, an AV fistula revision for malfunction or steal. Now that would depend on, on, on what the malfunction is and how badly it's performing um, and how bad the steal is, you know. Um, but if we can postpone it, let's postpone it for that 30-day period. And um, accordingly, a fistulogram to identify the malfunction, uh, we want to try to postpone that if possible. Why bring a patient, and here's the rationale, why bring a patient in to um, a setting, a hospital, right, that has COVID positive patients in it, and why um, do we want to expose our patients to that if it's something that could have waited, um, you know, in hopes of getting rid of the COVID in that, in that institution, right? And so that's why they consider they want to postpone that if possible to reduce that potential for exposure. And um, AV fistulas and AV grafts for end-stage renal disease, stage four or five. Well, we know they don't start treatment at stage four, so those early placements that we really wish would happen could we postpone those? They say consider postponing that. Stage five, there's a stage five where they're not yet on dialysis. Can we wait? Well, now you're, you're getting close, but if push came to shove, they could put in a, a tunneled catheter and they could start dialysis if they had to. But those are the things that they were considered postponing. So that would be the difference. Stage tier two would be your non-essential and your tier three would be your essential surgeries. But now understand that you might still be having issues in your part of the country, right? Um, even though we've, we've had the clarification, um, but understand that there might be quite a bit of backlog of surgeries. So there might be other surgeries that they, yes, they waited, but now they really have to do them. So they kind of moved up a tier. So they have to get, they have to get through those surgeries first. Um, they furloughed staff from the operating rooms right, um, and said, we, we don't need you right now because we're not using our operating room. So they got furloughed. So they still could be short-staffed. They, you know, furloughing is the expectation is we bring you back, but we'll bring you back when we need you, right? Um, there's a lack of PPE in some parts of the country still. We've had a resurgence of the virus, and we've had people 
back phase, right? So if you're at phase three, you now might be at phase two or phase one. And so again, the hospitals may have had to to go back to essential surgery and um, it still may not be considered an essential surgery for some hospital settings. There's also been new local guidance that has come out from hospitals and hospital associations that may make your wait longer. So they may be requiring COVID tests before you go into surgery um, and things like that. And you may have to wait to get the results back before they take you into surgery. So um, that may be local to your area. So you really need to know what's going on locally, even though we've got these federal guidelines and these national guidelines from the, the College of Surgeons, it's, it may not be reflective of what you're seeing in your community. Next slide, please. All right, so we're going to take a look at, we're going to do an aneurysm assessment of a couple of, of uh, fistulas. Next slide. So when you look at this, I call this my ugly access, right? Um, this access may look like it needs immediate intervention. So let's look what you're assessing for. And, and nurses and techs, when you look at this, you go, well, yeah, I assess for this stuff all the time. Well, we're going to tell you the importance of why you're doing this assessment. All right, so patency. Of course, we can't do dialysis without a patent access, so you need to feel and listen along the entire access, the entire fistula, or what we call the cannulation zone. We talk about the feel of the access. We're talking about whether it's soft or firm. So I want you to do this right now. Puff out your cheek and hold it as if you're gonna blow into a trumpet. And then palpate that puffed cheek. It should feel firm. Right? Now, let the air out and now repalpate your cheek and feel the difference. That should be a lot softer. Well, this is a very important observation to make, especially if you're going to be talking to the nephrologist or to the surgeon about this vascular access. So, this is the difference between what staff do and what a surgeon does. Um, as far as evaluation for an access. A surgeon will do what's called a pinch test. So a pinch test means, and we won't do this. Nurses and techs, we don't do this, okay? This is what surgeons do. I just wanna tell you what they do. So this is, not, this is not what you should do. But they will take and they will pinch the skin right above the aneurysm. And if they get the skin, but not the access with it, then there's room for that aneurysm to grow so that's why in the past you may have sent a patient for an evaluation and they came back and the patient said, oh, the, the surgeon's going to wait. And you're like, what? Well, he did this test and he figured there was more room for it to grow, so it wasn't really essential to take care of it right there and then. All right? But as, as these aneurysms get bigger and bigger, the wall of the fistula pushes up against the tissue and they kind of scrunch together and they kind of mat together. Like a, like a matted dog, okay? So you know what I'm talking about with a mat. So if then when the surgeon goes to do a pinch test, it would happen, he would pull the skin and the access together because they're kind of stuck together, they're matted together. This would be an, an essential surgery. Um, it's, it would be very tight and for their expectation, they need to handle that one differently. So that's the difference. So that's why it's important for you to be able to tell a surgeon whether you feel firmness or whether you feel a softness. That gives him a kind of an idea since he can't be there to do that pinch test um, right now. So skin color. As blood vessels and skin thin, the skin color changes. So the next part of the assessment is to determine the coloration of the access versus the surrounding skin. Remember this though, the skin is not only the first line of defense against infection, it's the first line of defense against access rupture. This is why rotating sites is critical, so that we don't create these areas. As you continue your assessment, ask yourself, where am I gonna put the needles? This access has very limited cannulation zone you can start to see a couple of areas that you need to avoid due to damage that has already occurred. You wanna look for scabs. Scabs should only be as big around as the outside diameter of the needle gauge that you're using. 
So scabs that start looking like the size of your fingernails tell you that there might be decreased blood supply and poor wound healing as a result. These can easily become ulcerated areas. Another sign to look for and avoid would be depigmentation. You know, the pink mountaintops. We're starting to see areas develop on this axis. So there's three, there's basically three aneurysms in this picture. The one on the right looks like it's starting to get a pink top on it. And you can see there's little parts here and there on the other two bumps that look like um, we're starting to get depigmented. What happens is that the skin gets stretched so tight, we're actually now starting to see the next layer of skin. So that's why we want to stay away from those areas. And then um, assess for signs of stenosis. Um, an access should only have one thrill and brewy. So if you feel or hear a second one as you progress up the access, that's probably a sign of stenosis. And for fistulas, remember, we can use the arm raise technique to see how well the access drains, um, and that can give us a clue as well. Blood pressure control is critical, especially in patients that have aneurysms. High blood pressure and stenosis are the two ways that pressure's increased in that access that causes the aneurysm to balloon out. So do a really good job of documenting issues you find with the access to help the nephrologist and the surgeon determine if it's essential to repair or replace this access. So in this case, while there are a couple of clinical signs, this access will need to be monitored carefully for any changes, but the repair or replacement of this access could probably wait and would be deemed non-essential. Next slide, please. When we look at this access, we're going to apply all the access assessment points that I just talked about. So what worries me about this access? All right, the discoloration, number one. Again, this change in color tells me the vessel wall is thinning as well as the skin. Now, if you look at the picture on the right, but that doesn't look, that doesn't look near as bad as the picture on the left, right? But it's the same access. It's just taken from a different angle. So, um, notice the shininess and the tightness. It really looks like it's stretched tight. Um, and that's, when you, when you take a picture, notice how we get that reflection there. Well, that reflection is a reflection off a shiny surface, all right? Next, palpate. Don't poke, but place your fingers on the access and determine is it firm or soft. Now, my experience, would tell me that that's probably a firm access if I were to palpate right in that area. Um, if I was just looking at this picture and I didn't have any clinical experience, I couldn't be 100% sure about that. If a patient can't go to the surgeon's office, um, a telehealth visit would be an excellent way for the surgeon to determine if this patient needed to to actually come in and have, a, have the fistulogram done and, and have an evaluation done. Um, Another issue is the height of the aneurysm. It kind of sticks up there all by itself, right? And how well is the patient able to protect that, that area? Because that's a very thin-walled area right there. And do they bend their arm at all? How do they do that? And while the patient may be able to bend that arm, what kind of additional pressure is put on those vessels when they do bend it? I would suggest that this patient to bend this arm as little as possible um, just because of the extra pressure it can cause. And again, if the patient has hypertension, how well is it controlled? You know, I've seen patient records where blood pressures are running in the 200s over 120s. That's not controlled hypertension, and it puts patients with aneurysms at increased risk for rupture. I would really be concerned that this access is at high risk for rupture and would say that this would need immediate intervention. So I would say that this was essential. Next slide, please. So now we're going to switch and look at pseudoaneurysm assessment of grass. Next slide, okay. What do you assess for in a graft? Well, you assess for the same things in a graft that you do in a fistula 
there are a couple other things that you really need to be concerned with. So patency, the thrill and brewery along the entire length of the access, um, and feel, again, softness versus firmness. It's easier to determine if a graft is clotted because the access feels a lot firmer than a fistula anyways. Um, but we're talking about the pseudoaneurysm softness or firmness. Again, you will assess for skin color, your cannulation zone for needle placement. It looks like there's a couple of scabs in that right-sided um, uh, pseudoaneurysm there, which shouldn't be there, right? Our KDOKI guidelines say never cannulate an aneurysm or a pseudoaneurysm. Why? Hemorrhage, exsanguination, and death. So what happened here? You know, graft life is limited. They wear out, right? Uh, from repeated cannulation in small areas. Unfortunately, there looks like there was sufficient other areas for cannulation. You can see um, behind each one, in above the one on the left and below the one on the right. Um, but I'll bet that was that was the easiest spot to get into. So don't don't cannulate because it's the easiest spot. You know you always get there um, because. Um, what happens is if you continue to cannulate in those same small area, it develops uh, scar tissue, and there's no nerve endings in scar tissue. So eventually it will hurt a lot less in those areas. Then when you get somebody that comes along and said, oh, I can't stick you in that area, it's getting damaged there, and they try to move to a new spot, ah, there's all kinds of nerve endings there, and it hurts. And that's why patients say, no, only stick me there and there. And then we get into that that circle of, well, the patient told me to, so I do that, and now I've got this problem. You have to make the patient understand that that will permanently damage their access if you continually stick in those areas, and it wears it out a lot earlier. And that goes for fistulas too, um, but we end up with the, the aneurysm. We don't wear out the access per se, not like we wear out grafts. We kind of shred grafts um, in those areas. So um, we really need to make patients understand. We have to do a better job educating patients that it's not a good idea to keep sticking there. We've got to move those needles around. And after about six months, if I use the whole cannulation zone, it'll all have sufficient scar tissue that will decrease pain. So that's something that we have to make sure that staff understands and that patients understand as well. We need assess for scabs and ulcers and depigmentation. Um, so this will be the same as it was for fistulas, as well as monitoring the blood pressure. Um, we want to make sure that we're checking for um, um, uh, bleeding as well, any kind of leaking that might occur out of there. So when I look at this access, there doesn't appear to be a high risk of rupture. And therefore, any intervention that's short of clotted access um, would be deemed non-essential for this particular one. Next slide, please. So looking at this access, what worries me? Well, that color should be very concerning. It is so different than the surrounding tissue. Um, it, it almost looks like it's infected. I mean, it's, it looks really hot. We call those, we call that, we would call that access angry. That is an angry looking sight just because of that redness and just, you know, it's like, Arr, really bad looking. Look at how shiny and tight it is. If you palpated that access, um, it looks like it would be very firm, rock hard, in fact. Um, Firmness translates into how much pressure is being exerted on the walls of this pseudoaneurysm. Um, can you see that ulceration right in the center on the top? Um, there are several layers of tissue missing here. If we're going to see an access rupture, that's where it's going to blow right there. All right? I, I always, when I use this, I was, this is like Mount St. Helens. That's where it's going to blow right in that, that crevice there of missing tissue. In the literature published by medical examiners, they indicate that grafts rupture more frequently than fistulas. They've got that data. They've, they put that into databases and they collect that information. And that within six months of a rupture, there had been a spontaneous bleed of the access documented in the patient's medical record. 
So it's important when you're doing your initial questions to the patient, when you're doing that initial assessment of the patient, here's a question that you need to make sure you're asking. Have you had any bleeding from your access since your last dialysis treatment? I need to know that. That means that it's important, especially with an access that looks like this, especially anybody with, um, with a graft that has pseudoaneurysms. You need to make that part of your assessment because that's really important. You also need to make sure that you educate the patient on what to do in the event that that access should rupture. Right? I think it's, personally, I think it's important that every patient hold their own access sites. Why? Because I know that they know how to do it. Whether they do it at home when they actually have an emergency, that I can't, I can't swear to. But I know that if I taught them how to do it and they do it correctly in the clinic, that there's a 50-50 chance that they'll do it at home when they have to in an emergency. So that's why I think it's very important that patients learn to own that access and know how to stop bleeding. That's critical in my mind. So, um, again, if there's uncontrolled hypertension, this also elevates that risk and tear status to essential. So looking at this and knowing all of these points here, um, yes, I would consider this an essential surgery that needs to happen now. Next slide, please. I think we missed a slide. There we go. So we can't rule out infections in grafts. So what am I worried about? Well, the redness. A pseudoaneurysm is a big clot, big blood clot that sits on top of a shredded graft. So it's not the wall. It's not the wall that's bulging here. The wall is shredded and cut open, and the blood has leaked out and actually is sitting on top. So we're looking at a clot here. And the one bad thing about clots is that if bacteria is circulating in the bloodstream, then bacteria has just found the perfect hiding place. Why? Because it's difficult for antibiotics to penetrate clot. Our patients are immunocompromised to begin with. So if a, if a bloodstream infection um, is very dangerous now, and we know it's the second leading cause of death in our population, so if we got that bacteria hiding away in that clot material where we can't fight it, it then becomes deadly, right? Also, sloughing of the skin. Look at that. It's peeled back like a banana. How many layers of skin have we lost? And remember what we said about protection against rupture, the skin? So losing layers is not good. And I can see there's bleeding. It's seeping out there. So... If this patient also has uncontrolled hypertension, this could mean imminent rupture. So this would be an essential surgery. Next slide, please. All right, now we're gonna assess for Steele syndrome. Uh, can we go to the next slide? All right, so let's look at these graphics to see what happens. And I apologize, it looks like our graphics aren't gonna work, but you can still look at the pictures. So the one, on the, the left-hand side, this is normal blood flow. And you can see the arterial system um, mimics the venous system. And look down at the fingers. That's what's important. All right. So you can see that the blood supply is similar coming into the hand as it is leaving the hand. If you look to the right side, you can see in the upper right-hand corner of that, that graphic, we've got a fistula that we created. It's a little pink with a little black sutures around it. Now. Um, when we create a fistula, the high pressure blood flow from the artery will take the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is going into the venous system. It's not going all the way down to the fingers. It's making a shortcut and going right into that fistula. So notice the blood supply now into the fingers. It's a lot different than the picture on the left. And that's because that blood supply has been moved. Next slide, please. So you can see this hand doesn't look normal. There's modeling at the fingertips and blanching, right? A lack of blood supply will cause the hand to be colder than normal. The lack of oxygen 
will cause nerve endings to enervate, causing the pain. So, is there anything we can do as staff to make this patient more comfortable and improve their symptoms? Yes. We can um, complete the, um, I'm sorry, we can keep the hand dependent. So, that means we want the elbow to be higher than the fingers. And if we don't have a pillow to prop, then um, laying the patient's hand in their lap would make that um, a possibility. Make sure that you move the patient's hand. We don't want the patient moving their arm around after you've put the needles in. So you be very careful about where you want to locate that hand so that the fingers are lower than the elbow. Uh, we want to instruct the patient to wear a mitten or tube sock to keep warm. When we've got our digits together, um, one keeps the, helps to keep the other one warmer. When we separate them in a glove, there's no way for those digits to warm up. So that's why we want them together. And that's why a tube sock works really well, because some of you live in a part of the country where you may not own mittens, all right? But a tube sock will keep their hand nice and warm. Or a kitchen towel is fine. As long as they can see the access itself, um, we can do whatever we need to to the hand. Just don't do anything um, um, warm it in any way like putting hot water in a balloon or, or using an a electric blanket. We don't want to do anything like that um, because our diabetics won't be able to feel that it's too hot. Give the patient a squeeze ball and have the patient squeeze that during dialysis. And we're talking about a white knuckle squeeze. All right, there's a difference between just kind of squeezing on it and actually squeezing it tightly. That's how you get white knuckles, right? And so that way it increases blood supply to the hand when you do that. What happens when we increase blood supply? We increase oxygenation. So that should help bring um, less pain and, and actually kind of help to warm up that area. And we want to complete the 10-second assessment for Steele syndrome every dialysis if patients are exhibiting signs and symptoms. And I'll discuss how to do that in just a minute. So providing comfort measures and monitoring this access, it may not warrant immediate intervention. So it would be considered non-essential at this point. Next slide, please. This patient, on the other hand, is progressing to the need for intervention, either by an interventionist or surgeon. So what am I worried about? I'm worried about that extreme blanching of the fingers. Blanching is that white, those white fingers, and then you see red patches, but you see a lot of white patches. Um, there's a definite problem with even distribution of blood flow to that patient's hands. There's a large ulceration on that fingertip, and that's due to the lack of sufficient blood supply. Um, I expect to see damage occurring on the fingertips first because it's the furthest point on the body the blood must flow. All right. Left untreated, this ulceration will become necrotic or black where the tissue actually dies, okay? And then interventional surgery or surgical intervention for amputation is a must at that point, okay? So blood flow to this hand is urgent, so this would be classified as an essential surgery. Do not let it get to the point where it's necrotic. Next slide. All right, this is Linda's 10-second assessment for Steele syndrome. So, um, do you have 10 seconds to do this? I think you can manage to squeeze in 10 seconds for patients um, who are complaining of pain in their um, access hands or in their feet if they've got accesses in their leg, all right? So what do we need to assess for? Temperature of the hands, motor movement, color of the nail beds, ulceration, necrosis, and pain. So take the patient's hand in yours so the backs of their hands are facing you. We'll be doing a comparison of access versus non-access extremity. For arm accesses, it'll be the hands. We know patients' hands are cold, but if there's severe steel, the access hand will be colder. Next, look at the nail beds. We're looking to see if they're bluish or skin toned. Next, look at the fingertips. Are there any ulcers or black spots, necrosis? Then ask the patient to squeeze your hands. Again, we're comparing hands. People with steel often exhibit neurologic problems, difficulty holding on to things like motor, so that's motor movement, or the development of claw hand. The patient may have a weaker grip in their access hand. And finally, on a pain scale of zero to 10, zero being no pain and 10 being the worst pain you've experienced in your access hand, what is your pain number right now? 
So you want to document the results of your 10-second assessment, including the pain number. And if your patient is exhibiting progressive signs of severe steel, alert the nephrologist for potential referral and intervention. You are the first line of defense against steel syndrome. Next slide, please. So in summary, next slide. Emergent referral of a fistula, if it's shiny, tight, pulsatile, the diameter increase of greater than three times the original diameter, persistent skin breakdown or scab in and around an aneurysm, difficulty cannulating because of the size and extent of an aneurysm, excessive or prolonged bleeding at the end of dialysis, signs of ischemia distal to the area of enlargement or aneurysmal swelling, or rapid expansion of an aneurysm. Next slide. An emergent referral for graft, any lesion with purulent drainage in the cannulation zone, persistent, which is defined as greater than one dialysis treatment, of pain or inflammation, persistent scab previous, at a previous cannulation site, greater than three dialysis treatments. Usually scabs will heal in, um, uh, start to heal towards the end of the first week. Um, persistent, and this has been um, emergency room physicians say greater than an hour, bleeding from a cannulation site, especially in the presence of increased venous pressure. Now, in our dialysis units, what do we say? About, uh, some say 20 minutes is considered excessive. Some people say 30 minutes is excessive. By the time they would get to the, op to the emergency department, it would be greater than one hour probably, right? So any skin or subcutaneous tissue breakdown where the graft has eroded through, and pseudoaneurysms greater than twice the original graft diameter. Now, most of these are from the KDOKI guidelines on when to refer for aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms. You'll find those in the KDOKI 2000 guidelines and in the KDOKI 2006 guidelines. Next slide, please. Okay, now I'll turn it back to Matt and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Linda. And we have received a number of questions as we are, or you've been proceeding today. Uh, so I do want to take this opportunity to remind folks online, if you do have a question for Linda uh, and you haven't submitted it yet, now's the time to do so. Uh, we do have about uh, 10, 15 minutes available for questions here. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in, Linda. And, and the first one actually is for me, which <laughs> I, will, I will handle that. Of all that, imagine that. Um, is this slideshow available? for education for my staff. And uh, we're going to publish this slide deck along with the recording of this event uh, on our website, uh, um, which will be available no later than 72 hours from today. Uh, but you should see it there tomorrow, no later than Friday uh, would be my estimation. So same place you registered for this event, we'll publish it there. Uh, all right, Linda, now over to you. <laughs> So uh, obviously, COVID testing is required before access surgery. Um, what happens when you have one of those angry accesses, and it looks like Mount St. Helens, uh, but the patient has tested COVID positive and has an urgent need combined with a uh, positive test case? Well, I think that if you would ask any surgeon, they would say that they need to do this surgery. Um, knowing that somebody is... Um, potentially able to spread something to you, uh, I'm sure they have um, uh, more extreme precautions. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they might be wearing their, um, you know, N95 respirators instead of regular masks that they use. They might be incorporating shields as well as masks to do their surgeries. And, and that would include everybody in the operating room. But that is something that you would have to ask the surgeon in your area because surgeons they have, you know, they will um, not be told what to do. They will do what they think is best. Mm -hmm. So it, that's what I say is a, a general thing that could possibly, that they would probably do um, in the case of an emergency. Surgery. Right. Well, that makes sense. It actually leads into our next question. Um, and, and this is purely observational on your part, but have you seen or heard of any instances of surgeons uh, that, are not complying with what CMS has defined as the essential surgery tier due to an abundance of overcaution on their part, I guess is the, what we just talked about. We are hearing from some facilities that um, even though those guidelines have changed and, and um, 
that surgeons are not performing um, accesses and they're having trouble scheduling. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I think that's about personal preference and I think that may be, um, do they have the operation, operating rooms? You know, if there's an access center that's available um, and they may have surgeons attached to them, that that might be the route to go. Um, so they might have an interventionalist and a surgeon on staff at an access center or an ambulatory care center because um, some patients are afraid to go um, because of COVID. They don't want to get it. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, they're afraid to go, and so they'll put it off and put it off and put it off. But that could be another option for patients. Um, we, we did do a patient webinar on, on this same topic, and we actually had a patient. She described how it was that they had to stay out in the parking lot and she had to have a COVID test and they came in and they they um, did her intervention for her and then she was at an ambulatory care study and uh, and then she was released but she was exposed to minimal uh, patients and she had her procedure done and um, she did put it off for a month but then the staff told her we better not put this off any longer you need to go and so um, you know I, I'm glad that they did that, and I'm glad that she went. Right. Yeah. And that leads into our third question. <laughs> uh, I, you're wonderful at segues today. Thank you. Um, it, 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 flipping the, the flipping the question is, you know, how can we convince those individuals who are either COVID positive or, um, you know, or heightened sensitivities or fear of COVID to take some of these precautions and have these surgeries when their accesses look as they've seen we saw in some of these pictures today well you know i think that's where telehealth can play a big role um and where they can they can actually talk to the surgeons um and they can talk to their kidney doctor and they can show them the access and um, they can explain their procedure. This is what we'll do, and it's different than it was if you've ever had to come in for surgery in the past. You know, and, and, and it just kind of, we have to allay people's fears. Yeah, they are scared. Um, and so we do have to find a way, and, and so the surgeon can actually then take a look at that access and see maybe we can delay it for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're seeing in some parts of the country that we're really trailing off on COVID exposure. And so, um, we're seeing more and more that, that hospitals are like advertising for patients to come now, you know, um, that we don't have COVID patients and, and come on in. So um, patients may not know that. I mean, we've, we told them to hunker down and be scared. And right. so they're scared, right? And so um, um, it's, yeah. So they can allay their fears. They can take a look at the access. They can tell them why they think it's really important and, and the staff's reinforcing that. And so, you know, the patients ultimately have to make that decision about whether they'll go in or not. But if we give them the information and the knowledge, then they'll make an informed choice. Um, you know, and hopefully they'll get that done. But if they're refusing, again, if it's like fear of rupture of an access, you need to train them on what to do if it should rupture mm -hmm. at home and make sure the family knows how to take care of it. Um, anybody, their friends, whoever might have come at some point, you may have to call them on the phone. You may have to write things down and send it home. Written material so they can put it on the refrigerator are really good things to do for people. But um, yeah, yeah, there, we have to weigh risk benefits. So patients need to know that it's more important to get that intervention than it is to be scared about COVID at this point. Mm -hmm. What are your recommendations uh, you just mentioned involving family members and educating them on the potential for ruptured access? Um, what are your recommendations, uh, if, if you have any at this point, or if you could provide some at a later time, on, on educational materials for families, or how to best educate uh, caregivers and, and patients, for that matter, on what to do if that, if that access should rupture? Well, um, I did write an article. Um, and I referenced it on those on those slides um, on fatal vascular access hemorrhage because we didn't have any information. Um, since then, we've had a lot of publications. A lot of stuff about rupture is found in the forensic journals, not necessarily in the nephrology journals. So it's like um, we don't all read forensic journals. Mm -hmm. I happen to like to read them. <laughs> um, and I was part of the forensic association for years with nursing, 
And so I know that they exist. And so that's where I got a lot of my research for the paper that I published. But um, it's things like doing, uh, when you're doing your medication reconciliation on a monthly basis, you should sit down and, and do a teach back with the patient on what to do should the access rupture. You know, you've got some bumps on your access and you, you know, here are some things to, we want to show you to teach you what to do in the event that it ruptures. So I show them what I would do, okay? And then I say, now you show me how you would apply pressure, direct pressure, how you would elevate. And if there's family members in the house, you yell help and let them come and um, call 911, all right? And so you want to teach them that. Then you want to document that they can teach, then they successfully were able to um, do teach back and they were able to hold direct pressure, elevate and say, I'd call 911. Right? Then the next month, because they're not going to remember, one and done won't do it. You need to do it over and over and over again. So the next month, say, remember last month when I taught you what to do in the event that that you had some leaking or uncontrolled bleeding of your access? Can you remember? Can you tell me what you would do? And if they can't do it, then you re-educate, you re-document. You know what the lawyers are looking for? The lawyers are looking for your documentation. Number one, that you've identified that the patient has an aneurysm or a pseudoaneurysm. Number two, that you've done the assessment and you say, you know, it's, it's soft and it's, you know, there's some little bit of damage, but we're avoiding those areas. You know, there's no um, scabs in those areas, things like that. They're looking for that documentation. And they're also looking for the education that you provide to patients. That's critical. And if you can't find anything about that anywhere, then... Um, then have your education department create something or contact me. Please send me an email. Um, I've got lots of things that I've created um, that I would use for teaching. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And for, for everyone online, uh, Linda's contact information can be found on the uh, ESRD Network 13 website. Um, so. Uh org website. A uh, couple questions just came in. Uh, um, Tiffany asks, what about uh, long-term care facility patients that have to depend on the nursing home to send the patients for evaluation? Um, what I would do is I would definitely make some um, handouts and flyers on how to do an assessment. Um, because we know they're probably not doing a really good assessment. You know, they, they might be checking to see if it's patent. Um, they might be taking off the Band-Aids um, or not. But we need to put a list. This is what you should be doing for these patients. Uh, step one, step two, step three, step four. And in the event of a rupture, you do this, you do this, and you mm -hmm. call and you get them transported out of there. Um, you should provide that information in writing to the nursing homes that have your dialysis patients. That's critical. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, another question just came in. Uh, Tamara asks, is there a form that a patient needs to sign if they absolutely refuse to get an access? And I'm, I'm not sure if you know that one. Or I suppose you could make one. Um, I, I would think that your organization might have one. Um, I would check to see because um, it would come from your corporate office. Hmm. Um, but of course, they'd have to have some kind of access, right? So, uh, they but they could choose. Uh, they're allowed to choose, so they could choose a, a catheter. Uh -huh. So um, it's not their best choice. Um, and you need to make sure that you provide education for all the access types, for all the pros and cons, for all of the, the um, access. Types. What we're supposed to be doing is providing the knowledge mm -hmm. they're supposed to make an informed decision. And we should advocate for their choice, but the minute there's a problem with that catheter, we should be talking about the other accesses again and say, do you think it's time maybe to change to a different access type? Even PD, even PD, do not, never rule out um, going to, going home on uh, peritoneal dialysis. I'm sure that question was asked related to a specific person that that individual had in mind. Um, but, but thank you for reinforcing that education part. Our next question actually follows up on on that concept where 
Um, do you think or, or perhaps have you observed that patients with catheters who already have an infection risk uh, will be or are being swayed to move to a permanent access due to now another infection risk with COVID? I hope so. Um, that would be a new talking point to that. Moving patients to the home setting as opposed to the in-center setting um, mm -hmm. decreases their risk and getting um, uh, a less risky, uh, a less risk for infection access type, which would be a fistula or a graft. Um, we know that fistulas have the least amount of uh, infections and grafts are the next and catheters are the highest. So um, that may be a, a new talking point to try to um, let the patient know that they're kind of compounding their risk of infection right. with that access type. I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, whoever asked that question, it's, it's a wonderful um, way to reinforce the, the benefit of that permanent access. Um, we'll have two or three more questions. Uh, somebody asked, so we were talking about telemedicine and, and doing as, access checks, uh, and, and the question that was asked was, can doctors actually do a proper access check using telemedicine? And, and, and I would tack on to that. Um, are there certain areas where on a telemedicine access check we should be particularly uh, attentive to uh, since we can't be there physically? Well, you need good equipment. You need to be able to see the access really well. So some, sometimes um, uh, telehealth equipment, you know, it's not all good and all perfect and all very clear for you to see. But um, I think a surgeon can see enough to decide whether he needs to see that patient right away or whether he doesn't. The, the one thing he can't do is the hands-on pinch test, right? Right, right? So that's why we want to make sure that you relay to them about the firmness or the softness of that access, because that will kind of give him some of that hands-on that he can't do. But um, you saw the differences in those accesses I showed you today. Mm -hmm. You should be able to determine whether or not you think, oh, this one doesn't look quite so bad. This one looks really bad, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, I'm, and they've had lots and lots of experience with accesses. So, um, but they, and, and there may be some other things that they look for um, that we as staff wouldn't look for as far as, you know, um, evaluation technique. But I think they can get a good idea whether or not they, oh, I need to see you and I need to see you right away, sooner rather than later. All right, we're down to two more questions, um, and uh, this one I'm actually curious about myself. Uh, can you use the instant, we talked about tube socks and mittens and whatnot. Are those instant hand warmers, uh, that, you know, us people down no. here in the south, no. not no. usable for that purpose? No. They have variable temperature. I, I use them for golf uh, in cold weather, and I got to tell you, sometimes they get really, really hot. Mm -hmm. No, nothing that has any kind of mechanical heat. Again, uh, we have a good, we have greater than 60% of our population are diabetic, and a lot of them have neuropathy in their hands and in their feet. So we're talking either any kind of access, whether it's on the arms or the legs, that they can't tell you it's too hot, and their skin will blister. And then that puts them at real risk for infection. So we don't want to, to do that. You know, we don't want to burn them. So um, the, the best we can do is just kind of, kind of get them covered up. If we can get them to wear them all the time, you know, and maybe not during dialysis, they want to wear a glove on their hand. You know, if they want to be Michael Jackson, let them be Michael Jackson. <laughs> you know, maybe they can start another trend. Um, who knows? But uh, if it really bothers them, they should have something on their hand all the time, not just during dialysis, but because when we turn up the blood pump speed, we pull more blood, and sometimes their pain increases and their hand gets really, really colder um, when we're doing dialysis, that this is what we want to do during dialysis. But you might suggest that they wear something on their hand all the time if they want to get, you know, a fashionable glove. Um, you know, like the ladies of the 50s used to wear all the time, you know, with their pocketbooks. Um, that might be something that they can, that mm -hmm. they can do outside of the dialysis um, arena to keep it warm. But no, nothing... Like I said, nothing heated do we want to put in somebody's hand to hold. Um, you don't have time to go back and check on it, and they can't feel it to tell you right. that it's too hot. So those two things combined makes that dangerous. So don't do that. 
thank you for that. And and I think that's about the clearest answer we could hope for there. So, um, you know, uh, we'll be sure to uh, make sure that people avoid that. Um, our last question, Linda, uh, and this is related to a quality of life type issue. Um, this person asks that, or states that some of their patients are interested in exercising more. Um, you know, if, if they're, first off, if they're seeing anything like an angry access or anything like that, should they avoid that or uh, to prevent something like that from happening, are there things that they need to avoid uh, to avoid, you know, to avoid, avoid aggravating the access site? Well, if it if it looks angry and if it's something that you're really concerned about, you know, as a staff person when you're doing your evaluation, um, anything that, that causes an increased pressure in those blood vessels, you know, so straining, for instance, mm -hmm. can cause that increase. So if you're if you're gonna lift some some dumbbells, if you're gonna lift a bar, you know. Um otherwise if they don't have any if they if it doesn't look like it's emergent, if it's one of those non-essentials like we looked at, that yeah, it might be bumpy, they can have aneurysms and still do things. But um, if it looks like there's any kind of skin breakdown or any kind of risk there, I would see what they're doing. You know, what kind of physical activity are you doing? But otherwise, there's no weight restriction on lifting anything for anyone except in the first week, the first seven days after a surgery. You want to keep that to five or ten pounds. The surgeon will tell you what not to lift above, you know, that sort of thing. But after the anastomosis heals and everything, you should be able to lift whatever weight you want to. But again, if, you're, if you see damage that could be potential, that lead to a potential rupture, I think I would want to decrease any kind of straining that might be involving lifting anything that's really heavy. You know, whether it's weights or, or you know, a medicine ball, for instance, those kind of things that, that could uh, ask your doctor. Ask your doctor about those things. Why? Well, and I was just going to comment that we always see check with your doctor before starting any sort of exercise program. It's, it's kind Absolutely. of a common disclaimer. Absolutely. Uh, probably doesn't apply, uh, you know, very importantly applies in this instance. So, um, Linda, that takes us to the end of our question. So uh, I just want to thank you for spending the last hour with us. Um, I, I think that folks have found this very informative. Um, and we really appreciate you spending your time with us this afternoon. Well, thank you. I appreciate being asked. Wonderful. Thank you. And, and again, this recording we'll talk about here in just a moment. This recording will be posted uh, within 72 hours and a link to where it will be recorded uh, has been posted in the chat. Uh, so before we depart today, we want to remind you about the kidneyhub.org. Uh, this is our mobile friendly web tool for patients and professionals. Uh, in conjunction with the NCC and patient subject matter experts. Uh, and, and that's a really important thing to emphasize. Uh, we'll be adding new content to that, uh, this page constantly, this tool constantly. In fact, the, uh, we've just added a uh, link to the uh, kidney transplant hub on our transplant page uh, this week. So we invite you to take a, uh, take a visit out to the kidneyhub.org, see what's new, check out that transplant page, uh, and let us know uh, what you think, what you see, and what you'd like to see. Uh, so our next COVID events, uh, our patient-focused event is going to be uh, next Tuesday evening. It's August 11th, and that event starts at 4 p.m. Uh, and our next provider-focused event is one week from today, August 19th, and that's at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and again, you can register for both of those events at uh, www.kidneycovidinfocenter.com. Check them out. Registration links are available there. We'd certainly love to see you on our upcoming events. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for being here today. Our contact information is on the screen here, uh, as well as two links to additional resources where you can find COVID-19 uh, information for patients and providers. One is our casercoalition.com uh, COVID-19 page. And again, the other one, www.kidneycovidinfocenter.com. Uh, on behalf of the NCC, thank you for being with us today, and we hope to see you on a future uh, webinar event. Take care.